Good morning, and thank you for joining us for an inspiring conversation about documenting Black and Indigenous histories in the settler nation state known as Canada. As we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University campuses are occupying the territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Neutral Peoples. In alignment with Laurier's strategic plan, the Inspiring Conversation series seeks to elevate a range of perspectives and ideas, including those of our Indigenous colleagues. The sharing of knowledge is powerful and a foundational step toward reconciliation. We are grateful to share this space where we can hear, speak, and learn from one another. Perhaps you are joining from another location, and in that case, I would encourage you to take a moment to honor the Indigenous people who have lived and work where you reside historically and presently. Acknowledging them reminds us of our important work uh, to connect to this land where we live, learn, and work. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations and their relationship with land and water since time immemorial. I'm Lauren Burroughs. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a community organizer, educator, and student affairs practitioner who seeks to be in solidarity with equity-deserving communities and efforts towards a transformative social change that will allow for the abundance, joy, connection, health, freedom, and safety that we all deserve. Currently, I work at Laurier as the multi-campus manager for the Center for Student Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. The format for today is that we'll start by hearing from our two panelists and then have a conversation about ideas they have shared uh, or our own questions. So please feel free to pop your questions into the question box and I'll post them to our panelists later on today. To begin our conversation, uh, we have Anne-Marie Beals and Dr. Karen Cyrus, and I'd like to in uh, invite Anne-Marie to join us on camera. Awesome. Welcome, Amory. Uh, Amory Beals. Hi. Uh, Amory Beals, Nigam Them, is a two spirit mixed blood African Nova Scotian and First Nation Mi'kmaq from the territory of Mi'kmaqi and a faculty member in the community psychology program here at Laurier. Amory's work embodies anti racist praxis through collaborative efforts around oral digital storytelling and its importance as a form of testimony, knowledge sharing, and archival knowledge keeping of histories, geographies, and realities of Afro Indigenous peoples. So welcome, Anne-Marie. Well, thank, thank you very much, Lauren. I'm happy to be here. Hello, everyone. So for today, we're going to have a little conversation about proclaiming sure. our roots and uh, talking about the realities of Afro-Indigenous folks on Afro-Indigenous peoples on Turtle Island. So you can see here from the slide. So next slide, please. So yes, I am Anne-Marie, a mixed blood Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotia from the territory of Mi'kmaq. I am two-spirit Ilnu, that is Afro-Indigenous, where on my father's side, my paternal ancestors were enslaved and escaped from Virginia in the War of 1812, making their way to Nova Scotia. And on my mother's side, the Mi'kmaq have been on the, the land since, well, time immemorial. So I'm Indigenous to the motherland Africa and Turtle Island. Next slide, please. And as always, grateful to be welcomed as a visitor to the lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Neutral Peoples. I work to support Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee self-determination, governance, and sovereignty, which includes land back. Next slide. I am unapologetic in that my social location and worldview define the work I wish to pursue, which is anti-colonial and critical, in a sense, the reversal of the colonial gaze onto the systems and structures that perpetuate a hegemony of inequality and oppression. Next slide. I was indeed very fortunate. I think Creator was smiling on me when I came to Laurier in 2016 to work on the Proclaiming Our Roots project, as community-based research does, with a conversation between two friends who wondered aloud why we do not see mixed Indigenous Black people in the Canadian mosaic when we know that there are so many Afro-Indigenous folks on Turtle Island. Next slide. So with proclaiming our roots, we wanted to provide for those whose voices had been silenced an opportunity to share in joy. We are still here. We're not going anywhere. Next slide. Indigenous peoples and Black peoples in the diaspora have come together for over 400 years since the nexus of first contact with the white man in 1492 and the start of the European transatlantic slave trade. Next slide. In communities in Nova Scotia, because of proximity to the East Coast and in Ontario and to the West, because of the Underground Railroad, 
Indigenous and African diaspora communities experience shared distinct forms of historic and ongoing colonial oppression and conflict due to imperialistic conquest. But did you know, as documented by historian Roy Finkelbein, the indigenous nations also su supported escaped hostages on the Underground Railroad. Black freedom seekers and indigenous peoples shared a kinship based on a common enemy in terms of white settler expansion and colonization. Nations like the Ojibwa refer to African-Americans as cousins and brothers. As part of their world, worldview, the Ojibwa felt an obligation to help a population of stolen peoples and the shackles of slavery that were subjugated to imperialist tactics on stolen land. Next slide. Additionally, relationships between African diasporic and indigenous peoples were feared by settlers and colonial governments. As the white men sought to maintain spatial boundaries between the so-called distinct racial groups to ensure white settler control over land and resources. To that end, mixed blood indigenous black peoples have been erased in the historical context of the Canadian landscape, as we do not fit neatly into the imperialist racial hierarchy. This manifests as the underrepresentation of mixed black indigenous people in popular culture and media, and highlights the importance of visibility and representation for peoples in our communities. Next slide. Proclaiming our roots works to correct this erasure. As part of this ongoing project, we want to bring to the fore the voices of Afro-Indigenous peoples from across Northern Turtle Island. Using digital oral storytelling, Afro-Indigenous community members were able, to, were able to connect and reconnect to the land, essential for Indigenous peoples all over Mother Earth. While exploring the complexities of identity and place and space on land, and how our identities are shaped by how we see ourselves, our lived experiences, our cultural and historical contexts, as well as understanding societal perceptions of mixed Black Indigenous peoples inside and outside our communities. Next slide. In attempting to follow in the footsteps of Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator and philosopher who promoted liberation thinking within critical pedagogy, and who was inspired by Frantz Fanon, one of the most important writers in Black and anti-colonial theory, we, as in community members and researchers, came to understand that the co-creation of knowledges in our relationships could be used as the raising of critical consciousness and understanding how systems of oppression have, for over 400 years, set up to work against Black, Indigenous, and Afro-Indigenous peoples and their communities. Thus, with these realizations, the work began through a critical social justice lens to resist against oppression, as had our ancestors whose strength helped us survive, and to work toward liberation, to struggle against imperialist tools and colonial ideology, and that our children can thrive on the land and the heart of Mother Earth, free of the shackles of our oppressors. We are forging our own paths and creating our own stories. We are restoring the dominant narrative. In liberation pedagogy and praxis, we have the power to change the story. When we situate ourselves on the land, we are no longer erased. As part of critical consciousness raising, we reverse the colonial gaze back unto itself and reveal the hegemony for what it is. Freire shares with us that consciousness raising is necessary for liberation and how we are co-learning and perceiving social, political, and economic contradictions, and how we can act against the oppressiveness of the contradictions in moving towards liberation. Next slide. So we focus on Afro-Indigenous histories, experiences, and realities in recentering Indigenous Black voices for the next generation of Afro-Indigenous children. In Proclaiming Our Roots, we explore how Indigenous Black people survive in the context of imperial structures, such as colonialism, capitalism, racism, intersectional oppression, structural inequities, lack of territory, and social and cultural and geographic displacement, and the implication of these multiple intersection forms of violence on the overall health and well-being of Afro-Indigenous people. With a focus on the health and well-being of Afro-Indigenous peoples, we who are as diverse as the territories that they come from, connection to the land becomes a critical piece of the project. Currently, social and health systems within a framework of self-determination that are sources of support for Indigenous Black and Indigenous Black people 
are further stressed as we live through a COVID-19 pandemic and a climate emergency where blackness, indigeneity, and gender intersect with disability and age. Next slide. As a strategy of colonialism in the intentional and violent break of knowledge transmission in indigenous communities, colonial thinking replaces traditional ways of being and knowing. Next slide. Amy Cesar and Franz Fanon both warned not to follow in European man's footsteps, but also implied not to go back to the ancient way. Yet indigenous elders, knowledge keepers, scholars, activists, and community members promote the traditional ways and traditional knowledges as resurgence, as avenues to reclaim spirit and heal from the intergenerational traumas wrought by colonization. Knowledge keepers who understand that we must exist on these lands in a good way to heal, teach us that we do need to reclaim our traditions and customs necessary in the ancient ways, but make them available as practices that work in modern times. Next slide. Consequently, in telling our stories, we found ways in proclaiming our roots to heal, to reconnect to the land, to heal in a holistic way, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Through our co-creation of knowledges, we learned that land-based teaching and cultural reclamation, such as participation in ceremonies, learning territorial languages and a nation's traditions, as well as consciousness raising and re-education, diminish colonial patriarchal ways of being and knowing and healing our communities and releasing us from our internalized oppressions and racisms. As well, self-determination as agency was a recommendation, as is our fight for sovereignty and equitable changes in law and policy. But we learned overarchingly that as we embrace ourselves and who we are, we heal. As we heal, we feel joy. When we feel joy, we know we belong. When we know we belong, we feel love. And I will leave you with these words of love from Bell Hooks. Next slide. Love heals. We go forward with the fresh insight that the past can no longer hurt us. Mindful remembering lets us put the broken bits and pieces of our hearts together again. This is the way that healing begins. Beloved, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Anne-Marie, and for highlighting the necessity of healing and joy. I'm really looking forward to discussing some of these points with you further. Um, you. I just want to remind folks as well to please pop your questions into the question box, and I'll pose them uh, to Anne-Marie as well after Karen uh, speaks. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I now would like to invite uh, Karen onto camera. Welcome, Karen. Uh, for everybody, we're welcoming Dr. Karen Cyrus, pronoun she, her. Karen is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Music at Laurier. She is an ethnomusicologist whose research focuses on cultural expressions of Afro-diasporic communities. She has been driving interest in developing content to increase representation for learners of African descent, which led her to mapping Ontario's Black archives, a project that was initiated by Dr. Cheryl Thompson at Toronto Metropolitan University. Dr. Cyrus joined the project as a postdoctoral fellow before coming to Laurier and her role was to create an inventory of Black collections from archives across Ontario. So welcome, Karen. Thank you, Lauren, and um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. So I am coming from Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, I was a postdoc as Lauren said, called Mapping Ontario's Black Archive. And the purpose of that project was to create a database, a user-friendly database that would help persons studying Ontario, Black Ontario history, helping them to access the knowledge, the data, the resources that currently exist in African Ontario archival collections the history of African Canadians has been documented to some extent and it exists in institutional and community archives. However, each archive has its own way of describing their collection, which makes it difficult to locate. So the problem of access is one that we were addressing and we are addressing through this project. 
how do we create something that people can access in order to create their own stories to make um, creative endeavors, plays, dances, works of arts. So this project was and it is intended to facilitate creatives in accessing data primary sources that they can use for their for storytelling. Access to this body of knowledge, to the knowledge that exists in community and institutional archives is needed to develop and further Canadian, Black Canadian studies and to create content to redress the lack of representation in school curriculum in regarding Canada's history. And I say that because um, a lot of the interest in the archives comes from schools. Uh, teachers, school boards are trying to redress the situation where there is little representation but that work requires access to um, this data, which is not as accessible as it should be, right? So the inventory is designed to connect collections that exist all over for Ontario and will provide an organized and accessible catalog of resources about the history of persons of African descent in Ontario. The thought was by taking stock of what exists in African, Ontario and archival collections, we will be able to see what is missing and so reduce knowledge gaps in the archival record about African Canadian experience and history. Also by taking stock of what exists in the collection at this point, we can change the narrative in archival collection about the contribution of persons of African descent to Canadian nation building and defense. We also want to make sure that it is user-friendly. You know, an archive is, can be intimidating in terms of uh, finding sources, understanding the language. So we intend to address all of that by creating a user-friendly interface. I think that so many people will benefit from this. As I said before, we are serving and hoping to serve creatives, academics, anyone just interested in finding more about African Ontarian history. And as I said, the point is to make the resource easy to access um, for librarians, archivists, students, as well as any ordinary person who might not know how to navigate an institutional archive or how to decode and interpret finding aids and the various levels of description. So I just wanted to, if you go, go to the next slide, please. I just wanted to give you a view of some of the archives that I went to, archives that I investigated, archives that I collected data from. And um, there were two basic types, institutional archives, and that would include archives coming from the government, such as um, Ontario, Archives of Ontario, and university archives. I also looked at community archives too. And in the community, there were galleries, libraries, archives, museums, and they all had data that was relevant and data that would help to create this connection between um, archives throughout Ontario, which would give us a complete, or not complete, but as close as possible to complete picture of the movements of persons of African descent throughout Ontario. So some of the institutions, some of the sources that were very um, helpful was for example, like the Multicultural History Society of Ontario. And what we are looking at 
is an exhibit that they had um, called the African Canadian Experience. This was from 1992. And here we see, you know, images of African Canadians that we don't ordinarily see. Um, I was fascinated to see the women in, but they, they were called Black Cross nurses. And that was our um, version of Red Cross because as we weren't allowed in it. But what I found in the archives, and as I was collecting data, I could not um, go into every single story, but some things just popped up because what I was doing was literally collecting um, stories and, and, and collating and, you know, codifying. But some things just, you know, caught my attention. And this picture that we're looking at here with the Black Cross nurse, nurses was one of it. Um, more so because, you know, it, it had a link to Jamaica because the Black Cross nurses was an auxiliary group of the Uni Universal Negro Im Improvement Association, which was founded by Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican. And so um, it first started, the Black Cross nurses first started in the United States and then um, Canadians also started chapters here. So this was a very interesting picture for me. And, you know, I found that each type of institutional archive had a very special type of collection. Um, the Multicultural Historical Society of Ontario, their oral history, I found was quite interesting because it helped to fill the gaps of some of the stories that, you know, that were in some narratives, in some, um, uh, in some writings, somewhat incomplete. So I found the, that the oral history that they had was, it helps, it helps to fill a gap. Uh, the next slide, please. Here is, um, this slide is from the University of Windsor. And what they have created here is similar to what we hope will be done. What, what, is, what they have here is what we call a memory object. And they created from archival records, um, an exhibit based on the baseball um, league that was called um, the Chatham All Stars. And their exhibit, which was called Breaking the Color Barrier, uh, served to create memory objects of something that was just, was, did not receive the type of attention it should at that time. So what the University of Windsor has done, the archi archivists there, is to create uh, a story about it that, um, and quite comprehensive too, that can be used in schools, that can create representation um, for elementary teachers. Uh, they have lesson plans. And I think that they have done a good job of, of representing um, and, and showing the experience of men who try to create their own space where there was none for them. And um, of course, this is another, I, I talk about two types of institutions, the universities, um, the government institutions, and also the community archives. Uh, the next slide, and even before I, I talk about that, I, 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 do, I just want to make to sure that, you know, I uh, explain that, you know, the baseball team was a Chatham colored all-stars. I'm not quite sure if I said it slowly enough. <laughs> what we have here on this slide are um, three of several, I think there are about 25 to 26 um, community archives in Ontario. And um, these are just a few of them. Each one, as I said, having a very special um, type of exhibit, um, the Buxton National Historic Site and Museum, Amherstburg Freedom Museum, and the Chatham-Kent Black Historical Society. These have all 
sought to collect stories of persons of African descent, um, to create not only exhibits that were, you know, um, in exhibit boxes or, or to have, for example, binders of letters and photographs and the type of community engagement, which I found so impressive, where they were connecting with the community online through Facebook. But in some cases, they also had buildings, you know, uh, where you could look and see what life might have been like for persons of African descent in the past. So these, pro these provide, these community archives provide a very diverse collection and it shows the strength of community archives. It shows the strength of their audience engagement and there's much to learn here from them. The next slide is um, a question. What can we learn from history about the ways that persons of African descent thrive, thrived or did not thrive in a hostile environment? So that's the question that, that I had. How, how, did, how, how do we survive? What, what happened? And if we turn to the next slide, please. To partly explain that, um, the concept of heterotopia by Mikhail Foucault comes to mind. It's creating a world within a world, right? And what that means is that as with, in the midst of the everyday stress and trial that to this day we still feel, surviving means finding a space of catharsis where you can just be, where you can just enjoy the company of your fellow Africans, fellow sufferers at time. You know, you can just, you can just be away from the gaze that we're often under on a daily basis. And Foucault's had six points to what a heterotopia is. And by looking at the archives and the kind of pictures that I, I, I saw, I saw a lot of this. Um, it, it says that it can take very short, very forms and can be found in any place. The purpose of the space may change. That means that you are in a, you know, you may occupy a space that um, while you are there becomes uh, a space for, let's say, Canadian, Caribbean Canadian people. And then in the daytime, it's a movie theater or at another time it's used for another purpose. So it, it transforms by your just being there. Um, it provides uh, a total break from everyday time. So when you're in the space, you feel like, you know, they, they talk about, it's similar to the concept of, of flow where time just passes, you just enjoy being there. Um, another point that he has is that you need permission to enter it. So there is some, you know, there is some criterion to enter the space, whether it be by ethnicity or other factors. And it's distinct from, but connected to the outside space they inhabit. It's a space of illusion. It's not permanent. When we leave, it goes. And when we come back, it comes again. So I found that as I, as I looked at these pictures, going through hundreds of pictures, we eventually had about over 5,000 um, fields in our data. Um, and of course, most of them were pictures the idea of creating this space where people can just be and can be away from the stress just for a moment, that came over and over again. I saw that over and over again. And in the next slide, we have one of them. This, of course, is a picture of a church and we have persons of African descent dressed in their Sunday best. 
And this um, picture was taken in Dresden, Ontario. It's a part of the Alvin McCurdy Fonds, which is part, which is located in the Archives of Ontario. And I must say that the Archives of Ontario, they are making a, a concerted effort to, um, to feature and to uh, honor the funds, the papers, the documents of persons of African descent. So this is just one of them. Um, and of course, you know, a church is a contested place, you know, but for many, for persons who are freedom seekers from the South, churches help them to find their way to Canada and churches provided that space where they could gather and just be. Next slide, please. I hear some more um, photographs, some more pictures of um, black spaces. And these are also from the Alvin McCurdy bonds. Um, uh, as I said before, churches have continued to play a part um, as a someone who's interested in community music and who researches community music. Um, this is one place where uh, persons of African descent would receive training to this day. You know, the song that we hear on in, in, in African-American rhythm and blues, that song comes out of gospel. And so we have one space in which persons of African descent could achieve and could receive some musical training in addition to serving their community. And we have a, another picture to the right of a Sunday school group uh, once in Amsburg, uh, once more showing people just enjoying their company. Uh, you know, some people think that yeah, of course, it, it was it was a time that was stressful, hard, terrible. But there were these moments where people could come and and enjoy and be beautiful, just as they are. Next slide, please. This is the chat on colored oil stars, and um, this picture is part of the, um, the exhibition that I spoke of earlier from the Center for Digital uh, Archives, I forget the name, from the University of Windsor. And what I want you to look at is the smiles on these men's faces. Let's stop there. <laughs> um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of uh, documentation, photographs of um, persons of African descent who joined um, the ranks in the army, um, women who fought to be accepted in the war effort by joining the ranks. And it was a very stressful time for them being among, um, being the only black person. It was stressful and, and they suffered, but there is value in that. And there is value in just being among persons where you share a common experience. And when I see the smiles on these men's faces, of course, they were probably told to say smile, cheese. <laughs> this is true. But I'm hoping that it is reflective of enjoying a game without um, the, 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 the microaggression, uh, overt aggression. Um, that may have happened in other spaces. Next slide, please. In the Alvin McCurdy funds, there are also um, document and evidence of Black excellence and Black business. You know, uh, what did men do during the 1900s, the early 1900s? And we have an example of what some men did, you know, you had 
um, other examples of black, black business, for example, um, there were families that had black families that had um, public transportation. One of the first ones in Ontario was by a black family. So there was black business, you know. The point is we didn't just come here. Um, persons of African descent have been doing well in the midst of suffering for a very long time, right? However, the problem is that a lot of our contribution has not been focused on and has caused erasure from the history and narrative of Canadian nation building. Next slide, please. And so that's why this project is so important. We are trying to create the space, the access to add to the story of Canadian nation building. Here we have another picture. This one is from the Toronto Public Library archives. And, um, and they have quite a bit, you know, this is uh, more contemporary. Uh, and this is Carabano afloat. And um, it has a different name now, but it just goes to show you celebrating their ethnicities, celebrating their culture. This to this day is a very important part of a healthy community. And um, yeah, I, I am grateful for whoever was able to uh, document and put this picture in the archive so that we can look back and find these images and find evidence of what life was like for persons of African descent in this province. Next slide, please. And this is my final slide. You know, the idea of Teratopia, finding a black space is so important. Um, while I was at York University, I did my PhD at York. I was, I had the pleasure of being in the York University Gospel Park Choir for about seven years as a teaching assistant as a TA. And um, it was a space that was just joy. Talk about catharsis. And this just goes to show, I, I put this here last. This wasn't in the archives. This is coming from, um, this was not in the archives, but I have this here to show that creating black spaces is an important part of our history. And even more important is documenting those spaces. Thank you, that's it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate your focus on access and accessibility for histories that are often invisibilized and the ways in which we can negotiate those institutional and organizational systems that are complex to navigate and the ways in which we can both create and share spaces for just being as we are. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to invite Anne-Marie back on video as we move into the Q&A portion um, of our space today. Awesome. So thank you for everyone who's posed questions uh, and to the participant who shared that they saw their grandmother in the photo of the Black Cross. That was awesome. Yeah, that's really awesome. That's a special connection. Um, and I just want to remind folks, uh, please feel free to continue to pop your questions into the chat and we'll do the best to answer them. Um, so first and foremost, uh, we had uh, someone ask if Anne-Marie would be able to share the paragraph at the beginning of your presentation about embracing ourselves and healing, um, again, as it, if, as it was beautiful and impactful. Sure, how would you like me to share it? Should I put it in the, the chat? I'm trying to find the question, actually. Um, yeah, I think if you had the capacity to drop in the chat or just read it again. Okay. Um, I'll put it in the chat and then I can read it. So this is from Bell Hooks, just to be clear, who always has such a really clear way of saying what's on so many people's minds. So Bell Hooks shares that love heals. We go forward with the fresh insight that the past can no longer hurt us. Mindful remembering lets us put the broken bits and pieces of our hearts together again. That is the way that healing begins. Thank you. And you can find it online too. Amazing. Uh, so thinking about mindful remembering, uh, that leads us into our next question. Um, and this is a question for both presenters. Uh, this participant shared that they are someone who is seeking to reclaim the knowledge of their Black and Indigenous heritage. However, they're struggling to find resources to trace archives to complete their story. 
and then are engaging with the challenge of becoming uh, reconnected with community that remains if it remains as uh, they've been forcibly displaced multiple times since the 1600s. Uh, this participant also notes that Amory, your voice spoke to them uh, in this time right now uh, when you said, we are still here and I'm hopeful. It's important to not let us disappear. Yeah. So again, the question is, um, how do people find resources when so much of that history is lost? Do you, do you mind if I answer that, Karen, to start? So maybe I'll answer that with, with another question. So um, one of the resources is proclaimingourroots.com. So you can go there to uh, the website and there are resources on that page as well as uh, ways to connect uh, with other Afro-Indigenous folks. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a struggle just because, you know, colonialism is very purposeful in trying to maintain those breaks in uh, generational knowledge transmission. Um, but finding folks who are like-minded uh, and working together and, and trying to connect and figure out what it is that you want to do while realizing that um, it is a purposeful thing that, you know, the more breaks in knowledge transmission that we have, the better. So colonialism wants to share with us um, to resist against that and, and seek out um, ways to connect with your communities. But, but finding others, like we shared in Proclaiming Our Roots, can help in that process. There are so many people from so many different nations and territories uh, that are connecting now because we are still here and, and we are uh, coming together in ways that we haven't been able to do so before. Um, so I would say, check out the website, maybe send an email and we can talk further about that and what that looks like. Um, but yeah, we will not be erased any further, so. And I could add to that, Anne-Marie, um, we have proclaiming our roots in our database. <laughs> I know, I, would have, I actually viewed all the videos, I thought it was fantastic, and gave such a, a, um, a rich understanding of the the mix of indigenous and persons of African descent. So thank you for being a part of that. And you know, that's the that's the whole purpose. That's the whole point to, to what um this person is saying, that struggling to find the archives, this project when completed, um, Dr. Thompson like likes to say it will be a one-stop shop <laughs> where Using um, using a search term will show you where resources are throughout Ontario. So we have already included um, much of the data that has been created at, in individual archives and placed it in one space so that a search will show all the possibilities, not just with proclaiming our roots, but in other parts of Ontario also, you'd be surprised the connection that you can, and we've been able to make through this. So uh, yeah, I hope that, um, you know, that this data and this, uh, the data that we have and the database will help people to readily access their ancestry. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Karen. Uh, that leads us to our next question, um, and that a participant has brought forward the ways in which um, uh, archives about Ontario uh, might include or disclude uh, folks from across so-called Canada, uh, including Black East Coast Indigenous folks, uh, as well as Black West Coast experiences. And so they asked, where can we find Black Canadian archives? Those would be your community archives. Um, for example, the Buxton, um, the Amherstburg, um, Chatham Kent, and about, um, I, I would say around 20 other um, community archives throughout Southeast Ontario. Um, they're there. Uh, uh, is there 
I'm just trying to think, is there a database that tells you where they all are? The Ontario Black History Society um, is a good place to start if you want to find the names of most of the Black community archives. So the Ontario Black History Society would be a place to start. Um, what we're doing is a little different because we're giving, um, you know, unique identifiers so that we can um, track persons of African descent throughout Ontario and kind of create a net. So, but in, in terms of finding these archives, the Ontario Black History Society, I hope I got that right. Natalie, um, oh gosh, her name escapes me, but just, just look that up. That should be helpful, I think. Yeah, and maybe I'll add Odis. There's the, the Black Loyalist Society has a very rich archive, um, as well as the Black Cultural Center um, in Preston. So uh, those are also two archives for the more Eastern look. Thank you. Moving to the next question, uh, there is one about some of the challenges and resistance that you folks have encountered in trying to recover these stories, uh, whether that be archival structures or um, histories that are not preserved, um, challenges about, about obtaining community stories, or uh, general mistrust of colonial archives when trying to recover oral histories and stories. So again, uh, some of the challenges or resistance you folks have experienced in, in doing this work. Do you want to go first, Emily? Or... Okay, all right. So that, that's an easy one. So I might um, write to um, archive and explain who I am. Said um, I'm looking for records. We have nothing. No um, black history in this archive. And I would have to say, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? I, I've said I, I, I'm not looking for a collection. I'm looking for fragmentary records, which means uh, when you think about an archive, they, they, they have levels of description. And so you might have families and, and what you will find a lot of is um, white families carry um, boxes of, of their records to the archives. And so they will have a collection. Within that collection is a, 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 a file, a series, and then you have items. So I would say, I'm not looking for a collection. I'm looking for items. Have you come across any items that have persons of African descent in it? Meaning any pictures, um, any records of, because I've often found um, pictures of persons of African descent in, in company records where they have pictures of the entire staff. I said, okay, so that person was in this area. And so, the, the, the resistance there is to say, no, we don't have any. Well, in truth, there are records there, but it just takes the manpower. And to be fair, um, many archives are operating on the staff, one or two people. So it is kind of hard to go through all of these photographs. So it's, it, it's going to take investment to get the manpower to go through these records and to find them. The, the, I must say, though, that on a whole, um, Archivists have been very, very helpful and supportive because um, at this point in time, uh, people are under pressure to show um, Black history. So it works for me in that way. But um, the, 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 the typical time kind of um, response is to say that we don't have anything. Yeah, so that's it for me. Yeah, thanks, Karen. And maybe I'll, I'll add with that, from an epistemological perspective, we have to think about, you know, what, what counts as knowledge? So our knowledge is often shut out of the dominant narrative. When we think about what counts as knowledge, our stories are knowledge, and it's purposeful, again, that our stories are not told or reframed in the dominant narrative in that we don't get to tell our stories. And so um, when we restory, when we tell our stories, we are reframing that, that dominant narrative. Um, but you know, there's pushback and resistance to that, that our knowledge is valid and that our, our knowledge is real. 
And maybe I'll also add on a, on a broader level that, you know, we're witnessing right now the stonewalling of the Catholic Church and the federal government in releasing records uh, from the residential schools. And so what does that mean when trying to, to find our stories in these archives that, that they are holding or destroying? So, uh, you know, that's just another component of, of, of what we face in trying to share our stories. Thank you. Uh, so just being cognizant of time, I know that there are, are quite a few questions in the chat. So I'm going to try and put a couple of them together as our last question before we end our time together. Um, so how do you suggest that families and communities use these resources, um, including how do they find their own family histories when they've been lost um, uh, or when family members pass away and those histories um, uh, are not as accessible? Um, or how do people engage in alternative practices of archiving outside of institutional or organizational models and practices? Some of the um, Black community archives have genealogists who will help. Um, of course, it depends on where your family is, right? But they will, they can help if you're, if you're um, six, seven generation is Canadian, um, they can help to trace that. I know that that um, service is offered and um, many of um, the Black archives have folders that uh, have been donated by families. Um, one, of the, one of the important things to remember, you know, is that those records are created from or papers or documents that we have, um, a diary, receipts, a Bible with notes in it, photographs. And it's important to make, to safeguard those, um, papers, those fonts, and to put them somewhere where it can be of value. Sometimes um, when an elder passes on, the family doesn't know what to do with the papers or they're shared. And sometimes that works against it. So um, if there's a culture bearer in the community, it is good to, it, it, one must have a conversation about these things, right? But recording of history, um, it has to be intentional and we have to make sure that our papers don't get lost. I tell my children that box needs to go to such and such archive, <laughs> right? Or all the work that I've been done, I've done would have been lost. So I, I, I don't think, I, I'm not quite sure if black families are thinking about that just yet. Um, certainly for the elders in my family, I have been telling them, please, make sure that you, you think about where um, these papers will go and what do you want to see done with them, right? Yes, that's it, thank you. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, of course. Um, so the question is specifically looking at um, recommendations for individuals, families, and communities on how they can use these resources uh, so finding their own family histories uh, when they've been lost after family members passed away or uh, ways in which folks can engage in alternative practices of archiving outside of um, institutional or organizational models. Right, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that on a practical basis can be done is just you know having conversations with the elders and the knowledge keepers um, about many things that are part of their stories, if they are so willing and be perhaps rec recording it with a phone and having that archive there. Um, and then learning languages and keeping them on and just having the conversations and connecting youth and elders and knowledge keepers together, I think is an important part of that. But if we are archiving using technology in ways that we can have this knowledge for, for generations to come. So I think, yeah, a really basic way is if, if you know, it is permissible and it's okay, 
to record some of these conversations to have uh, with the people in our community and sharing their stories. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Uh, I know there are some more questions in the chat and unfortunately we won't be able to get to them, but I really appreciate folks uh, reaching out and I encourage people to continue to engage with the projects and the important work of Anne-Marie and Karen. Um, and I'd like to thank Anne-Marie and Karen so much for participating and uh, sharing your expertise uh, and your knowledge and also uh, opening up the conversation about the ways in which we uh, talk about being and being present uh, as an act of resistance. Um, thank you to everyone who attended and listened and posed questions, and we will be sending a link to the recording as well as upcoming conversations in the next few days, uh, including uh, the next conversation on March 2nd titled Addressing Homelessness in Our Communities. So uh, we will end this here. Thank you again, everybody, and I hope people will stay safe and take good care of themselves and others and find those spaces of joy that both Anne-Marie and Karen invited us to, to find. Thank you.